Good morning. I'm Josh Lipsky, the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center, and we are so pleased to host today's event with Undersecretary of Treasury Nellie Liang in partnership with our colleagues from the Harvard Kennedy School, Stanford's Future of Digital Currency Initiative, and MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. We meet this morning almost precisely one year after President Biden issued a landmark executive order on digital assets. At the time, the executive order was one of the most forward-leaning documents produced by the US government on both the innovative possibilities as well as the risk presented by the range of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, central bank digital currency. The executive order committed that the US government would help foster an environment of responsible innovation while continuing to be a standard setter in the international financial system. Over the past year, the digital asset landscape has been redrawn. The collapse of algorithmic stablecoin Terra Luna and the cryptocurrency exchange FTX have raised urgent questions about the current regulatory framework in the US. Meanwhile, the world has not stopped moving. As our research at the Atlantic Council shows, there are now 105 countries comprising over 95% of global GDP currently exploring a central bank digital currency. More than 60 nations are now in an advanced phase of exploration, meaning they have moved past research and into development, pilot, or launch. This includes 18 of the G20 economies. In fact, by the end of 2023, it is likely the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England will have all committed to pursue central bank digital currency pilots. All of these developments raise the question of where the US now stands. As the issuer of the world reserve currency, the United States has a unique responsibility in the global financial system. But the need to adapt and innovate begins at home. Our domestic payment systems in the US are slower than many other advanced economies. These delays and inefficiencies lead to higher costs and unnecessary fees for the people who can least afford them. How will the US lead? How will the US continue to be a standard setter? How will the US improve its domestic system while ensuring new technologies around the world preserve privacy and do not threaten financial stability or enable bad actors. We have the perfect person to help us answer these questions today. Nellie Liang is the Under Secretary of Treasury for Domestic Finance. She was confirmed to that position in July 2021. Prior to serving as Under Secretary, she was a visiting scholar at the IMF, my former home, and she served for over three decades at the Federal Reserve Board in a range of senior roles including Director of Financial Stability from 2010 to 2017, a time where both domestic and global financial stability were being challenged in ways they have not been in decades. Following the Undersecretary's remarks, she will join Dr. Daryl Duffy, the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Finance at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, for a conversation. But first, Madam Undersecretary, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much, Josh, for inviting me here. Thank you to the organizers for today's workshop and to speak on um, the next steps, the future of money and payments in the US. So as Josh said, roughly one year ago, President Biden signed an executive order calling for a government-wide approach to the responsible development of digital assets. The goal of the executive order is to promote responsible innovation while also mitigating risk to users, the financial system, the economy, and national security. In response, Treasury prepared reports on the future of money and payments, current use cases of crypto assets, and their effects on consumers, investors, and businesses, and an action plan to mitigate the illicit finance risks of these assets. The Financial Stability Oversight Council published a report on the financial stability risks of digital assets and identified regulatory gaps. Failures of large crypto firms, runs on stable coins, and substantial investor losses in the past year confirmed many of the concerns that were cited in the reports. Commingling of assets, conflicts of interest, lack of risk management, and other standards contributed to these episodes. These developments reinforce the recommendations that were made for regulators to rigorously enforce existing laws to protect consumers and prevent the use of crypto assets for illicit finance, as well as to continuously monitor whether emerging products or services would require new regulations. 
In addition, the reports recommended for Congress to expand regulators' authorities where gaps have been identified, including with respect to the issuance of stable coins. My remarks today will focus on money and payments, the future of money and payments, and more specifically on central bank digital currency, CBDC. Central banks are at the heart of the global monetary system. Central bank money anchors the value of commercial bank money, provides a risk-free asset for settling interbank transactions, and central bank payment systems serve as the backbone for payment systems more generally. Given its key roles, changes in the design of central bank money and payments could have profound implications for the financial health of consumers and the economy. So CBDC is one of several options for upgrading the legacy capabilities of central bank money. Another is real-time payment systems. The Federal Reserve has indicated that it expects to launch the FedNow service this year, which is designed to allow for near instantaneous retail payments on a continuous basis using an existing form of central bank money, that is central bank reserves, as an interbank settlement asset. In contrast, a CBDC would involve both a new form of central bank money and potentially a new set of payment rails. Both real-time payment systems and CBDC present opportunities to build a more efficient, competitive, and inclusive U.S. payment system. In the U.S., policymakers are continuing to deliberate about whether to have a CBDC and if so, what form it should take. The Fed has also emphasized that it would only issue a CBDC with the support of the executive branch and Congress, and more broadly, the public. Even as policy deliberations continue, the Fed is conducting technology research and experimentation to inform design choices so that it is positioned to issue a CBDC if it were determined to be in the national interest. So with that framing in mind, let me describe the steps we are taking to advance work on policy issues posed by the prospect of a US CBDC and to engage internationally to support responsible development of global CBDCs. Treasury's report on the future of money and payments called for a Treasury-led interagency working group, the CBDC working group, to advance work on CBDC. One of its central tasks is to complement the Fed's work by considering the implications of a US CBDC for policy objectives for which broader administration perspectives would be useful. To give you a sense of how we are pursuing this work, I will describe our approach to thinking about CBDC options, the policy questions we are attempting to answer, and the kinds of recommendations we hope to develop. As a digital form of the country's currency, a CBDC would, like, would have three core features. First, it would be legal tender. Second, it would be convertible one for one into other forms of central bank money, reserve balances, or cash. And third, it would clear and settle nearly instantly. Beyond these core features, however, creating a CBDC would involve many design choices. An especially important decision is whether to have a wholesale CBDC, a retail CBDC, or both. In characterizing wholesale and retail options, we have found it useful to think about how each would differ from current money, from current central bank reserves. In particular, whether the core differences relate to technological features or to access features, i.e. the users that would be able to access the CBDC. For wholesale CBDC, the basic difference from central bank reserves would relate to technology. For example, a wholesale CBDC could be a tokenized central bank liability, which potentially could support around-the-clock payment activity, atomic settlement of transactions, certain types of programmability, or other benefits. By contrast, the access-related features of a wholesale CBDC may or may not differ from central bank reserves. A wholesale CBDC could be accessible to financial institutions 
that are currently eligible for central bank accounts or to a wider range of financial intermediaries. But while policymakers might consider granting access to a wholesale CBDC to institutions not currently eligible, that decision would be an independent choice rather than a necessary consequence of having a wholesale CBDC. Of course, technological differences between a wholesale CBDC and reserves could have significant practical implications. For example, a wholesale CBDC could support interbank settlement among commercial banks if they were to issue tokenized deposits or provide a risk-free settlement asset for tokenized securities transactions. It might be used as a backing asset for stable coins, which could make it easier to transfer value among stable coins, in addition to supporting greater interoperability and choice. And depending on design, it could enable more efficient cross-border payments by increasing the speed of settlement or through participation in new multilateral platforms for cross-border payments. At the same time, some of the benefits of a wholesale CBDC might also be possible through upgrades to existing central bank payment systems, including interlinking systems in different jurisdictions on new multilateral platforms. With retail CBDC, by contrast, the most important difference from central bank reserves is related to its access features, not its technology features. Unlike central bank reserves, a retail CBDC would be a digital liability of the central bank that is accessible to the general public. In the Fed CBDC discussion paper, the Fed stated that a potential US CBDC, if one were created, would best serve the United States by being intermediated, meaning that the private sector would offer accounts or digital wallets to facilitate the management of CBDC holdings or payments. In terms of technology, a retail CBDC might involve a different architecture compared to a CBDC that is intended solely for wholesale use. A retail CBDC could contribute to a more competitive and innovative payment system, support financial inclusion, and help preserve the singleness of currency. The extent to which it would promote these objectives would depend on many further design decisions, including decisions about the range of intermediaries that would act as service providers and the requirements to which those intermediaries would be subject, subject to. There are also risks to retail CBDC, including the potential for runs into a retail CBDC that could destabilize private sector lending during stress periods. So turning to policy questions, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the working group is intended to complement the Fed's, Fed's efforts by considering the implications for policy objectives for which a broader administration perspective is helpful. And these objectives fall into three main areas. The first set of objectives relate to global financial leadership, including the global role of the dollar. This role confers both economic and strategic benefits for the United States. Economic benefits include lower transaction and borrowing costs for US households, businesses, and government. And strategic benefits include influence over the architecture of the global financial system. In my view, global demand for the dollar stems from structural fundamental factors, such as our respect for rule of law, the strength of our economy and institutions, and the depth, breadth, and openness of US financial markets. These are fundamentally independent of whether the United States has a CBDC. Nevertheless, we are thinking about whether a US CBDC, to the extent it has functionality that traditional forms of central bank money lack, could help preserve the, the dollar's global role. We are also thinking about whether a US CBDC could help reduce undesirable frictions in cross-border payments or other activities. The second set of objectives relates to national security. The United States uses sanctions and other financial measures to address national security threats and to deny criminals and other illicit actors access to the US 
and international financial system. Some have suggested that the development of foreign CBDCs, including multi-CBDC platforms, could diminish the use of the dollar and the effectiveness of our tools in this space if they were to reduce the centrality of the US financial system and the dollar. In addition, new payment systems, including foreign CBDCs, may be designed without appropriate consideration of cybersecurity, user protection, and resilience measures. We are assessing the magnitude of these and other potential national security risks and whether a US CBDC or other tools could help to counter those risks. The third set of objectives relate to privacy, illicit finance, and financial inclusion. A US CBDC would need to both protect privacy of users and minimize the risk of illicit financial transactions. In addition, given that the United States has the largest unbanked population among G7 countries on a per capita basis, and that payments are expensive for some users, a potential US CBDC needs to be evaluated on whether it can promote inclusion and equity in the delivery of financial services. Across these three interests, global financial leadership, national security, and privacy, illicit finance, and inclusion, CBDC cho design choices are likely to involve some trade-offs. As an example, one way of reconciling privacy with illicit finance concerns in a retail CBDC might be to have a tiered structure in which less data are collected for small dollar transactions or for small volume accounts but limits on the amount or on the number of transactions could make a retail CBDC less useful to some end users. This suggests a three-way trade-off among privacy, countering illicit finance goals, and inclusion. The working group will work to identify trade-offs and possible ways of reconciling objectives, including looking ahead to possible technological advances that could reduce the size of any trade-offs. In the coming months, leaders from Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and White House offices, including the CEA, NEC, NSC, and OSTP, will begin to meet regularly to discuss a possible CBDC and other payment innovations. To support these discussions, the CBDC Working Group is developing an initial set of finding and recommendations. These may relate to whether a US CBDC would help to advance the three policy objectives described above, the features a US CBDC would need to advance those objectives, options for resolving design trade-offs, and areas where additional technological R&D would be useful. Full considerations of these issues for a possible CBDC, wholesale, retail, or both, will take some time to complete but the working group plans to provide interim public updates. Also, as recommended in the Treasury's report on the future of money and payments, the Federal Reserve is encouraged to provide periodic public updates as it continues its research and technical experimentation. In addition to working, to advancing work on the policy implications of a US CBDC, Another purpose of the working group is to engage with allies and partners to promote shared learning and responsible development of CBDCs. As others have observed, jurisdictions around the world are exploring CBDCs. According to the Atlantic Council's tracker, 114 countries representing over 95% of global GDP are exploring CBDC. 11 countries have fully launched while central banks and other major jurisdictions are researching and experimenting with some at a fairly advanced stage. For example, the Bank of England and um, HM Treasury, HMT, recently published a consultation paper assessing the case for a retail CBDC and outlining a proposed technological model. They are now entering the design phase of their work, estimated to take two to three years, after which the Bank of England and UK government will decide on whether to build a digital pound. 
In addition, as you know, there are multiple cross-border CBDC pilots, which involve central banks, international organizations such as the BIS, and private financial institutions. Regardless of whether the United States de de decides to adopt a CBDC, the US has an important set of interests in this work. We have an interest in ensuring that CBDCs interact safely and efficiently with the existing financial infrastructure, that they support financial stability and the integrity of the international financial system, that global payment systems are efficient, innovative, competitive, secure, and resilient, and that global payment systems continue to, pre continue to reflect broadly shared democratic values like openness, privacy, accessibility, and accountability to the communities that rely upon them. To inform global efforts to explore CBDCs, we plan to make contributions in two critical areas, international standard setting and technical expertise. International standards help promote efficient and sound domestic financial systems and global financial stability. There are both regulatory, they are both regulatory, like standards developed by CPMI, and technical, like those created at the International Organization for Standardization. With respect to payments, these standards support technical, business practice, and legal and regulatory interoperability and alignment. While CBDC-related technical standards, such as digital identifiers and messaging formats, may sound esoteric, they have important policy implications, such as for privacy. Governance standards, including those linked to participation in cross-border arrangements, also are critically important. Treasury's working closely with our colleagues at the Fed and in other parts of the US government to ensure that US interests are being effectively represented in standard setting processes. We are not starting from a blank slate, fortunately. While CBDCs are themselves new, there are long standing standards for financial activity, many of which can apply to CBDC no less than they do to legacy systems. Global anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing standards as set by the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, would apply to CBDCs, and the US government is working bilaterally and multilaterally to encourage countries to apply, to apply and enforce these standards. We're also actively working with allies and partners to identify where new standards may be needed. Our efforts to shape international standards are a key part of the framework for international engagement on digital assets that Treasury delivered in its report under the executive order. As we develop standards for CBDCs, we recognize that countries may, may make different design choices based on their policy goals, their legacy payment systems, and other differences in national facts and circumstances. Especially in the context of a new technology, there are opportunities to learn from a diverse set of approaches. At the same time, there are significant benefits to supporting the interoperability of new payment systems, including for CBDCs. And we will continue to work with our allies and partners during this exploration and development with these considerations in mind. In terms of sharing technology, and technical expertise with other countries that are developing CBDCs, the Federal Reserve plays a key role. This reflects its expertise in developing and running payment systems, as well as the Fed's existing relationships with central banks around the world. Others also have important roles. The National Science Foundation and the White House OSTP are leading an interagency process to develop a national R&D agenda for digital assets, which includes CBDCs. As part of this process, OSTP recently published a request for information that, among other things, sought feedback on technologies that could protect the privacy of CBDC users and while also preventing the use of CBDC by bad actors. As with other new technological innovations, beneficial innovations with respect to CBDC are more likely if we can harness the expertise that exists across governments, 
universities, and the private sector. So let me summarize and conclude. U.S. policymakers are actively evaluating whether a U.S. CBDC is in the national interest. As part of this effort, Treasury is leading an interagency CBDC working group to support the Fed's policy deliberations and develop recommendations for which a broader administrative administration and public perspective is helpful. Even as these deliberations continue, we recognize the importance of helping to shape global CBDC outcomes and will actively participate in global standard setting initiatives by sharing technology and expertise with other jurisdictions that are developing CBDCs. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here today and present on our next steps on money and payments. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, okay. Under Secretary Leong. That was, as usual for you, very articulate, <laughs> terrific overview, and a wonderful statement of the vision of the U.S. government in this area. Uh, thanks to the Atlantic Council for the chance to ask you a couple of questions, and then, yeah. and then take some uh, questions from online participants. And I would invite them, while, while you and I talk initially, to send in uh, questions through the Q&A function. Uh, so first, as you mentioned, the United Kingdom and the Bank of England reduced, uh, uh, released their consultative paper a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, they, I was interested to see that they said that a digital pound is now likely. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on their decision tree for eventually making that final decision. So the way they put it, they have an explore stage, which they say they have essentially completed. Now they're entering, as you mentioned in your remarks, a design stage, which could take two or three years. And if that's successful, the next step would be to actually build it, mm -hmm. uh, do pilot tests, and then finally, if it, if it seems to be working, to launch it. Uh, so I, I realize the United Kingdom and the United States are not the same place, uh, but does that kind of decision process seem to apply in the US? And, and if so, at what point are we in that decision tree uh, for the United States? Um, so thank you for the questions, and thank you for having me here today. So um, as I laid out in the speech, I think that decision tree makes quite a bit of sense. It is exactly, I would say, what the US is following. Um, we laid out a process of deliberations of research and exploration, um, design. Um, I would say they have maybe have split theirs up. I kind of view that research and exploration and design will be this more symbiotic relationship. We're going to learn a little bit from new advances, and that might change some of our policy decisions. But I would say very much in the, in the same, same realm. I think they have been more forward on seeing the policy benefits as um, favoring the issuance of a retail CBDC. Um, I think in the United States, they are still in the valuation, um, continuing to do the same R&D and design um, with a more open view as to what the final outcome would be. But I would say they're very similar. I, we lay out, and as they do, wholesale, retail, technology, access. Those are all key considerations. Um, um, I, would, I would put us as very much in the same approach. And I would think for most countries, the same thing. Uh, that's very helpful. And I'm, I'm not that surprised. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to step back uh, more broadly from just uh, uh, digital dollar to the, as uh, President Biden's executive order and your response to it uh, with your report last year put it, the future of money and payments. You mentioned that phrase today. So one of the challenges uh, in the United States for m the future of money and payments in the area of regulation is the generally accepted principle of same activity 
same regulation, which is difficult in the United States because other than the bank rail payment system, mm -hmm. payments are generally regulated state by state. So we have 50 sets of regulations and that will make it kind of tricky uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for in the United States to get good outcomes for you know stablecoin arrangements or non-bank uh, payment service providers like Google Pay or PayPal, and if someday a digital dollar comes along, uh, in order for it to achieve maximal effectiveness, it might be tricky to do yeah. uh, without some form of federal level um, uh, regulatory environment. So. Does all of that suggest the possibility in the United States of having uh, some sort of legislation that enables federal regulation of payments? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to speculate on whether we get legislation, but um, let me just say that was what the third recommendation in the report was to create a federal regulatory framework for payments. The first two was advance on a CBDC, and the second was the... Um, um, advance on the use of instant payments. The third being establish the federal regulatory framework for payments. Um, I think it's important, as you say, we have different, we have non-banks entering fintech firms and we have state by state um, that tend to use, have consumer protection, tend to have some AML CFT standards, but there's no neat, no assurance of consistency or for concerns about financial stability. So we did recommend to develop a regulatory framework, which will maybe at least a common floor among the states for these regulations. I think more standardized, more consistent regulation would also help to improve innovations. I think for the future as well, as we get to instant payments and maybe with the CBDC and how one could expand the user access, this comes back to our access features, you would want a more consistent approach to the, to the payment intermediaries. And so um, we are very much in favor of trying to develop that. As I said, I don't want to project, predict whether, we, whether legislation would be needed or a framework needed or could be achieved or whether uh, just a framework with a minimum floor and uh, cooperation would mm -hmm. be sufficient. Yeah, legislation is also very difficult to predict, as you, as you indicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, now going to draw from some of the questions that are coming in through the chat function. And uh, one of them concerns the issue of if you build a, a digital dollar, will they come? And, uh, to use uh, Kinsella's phrase from his famous baseball novel. Uh, so the, the questioner says, in the case of Nigeria, uh, which was one of the early uh, 12, I think, that were listed on, on the Atlantic Council's tracker as having released a digital uh, uh, currency. The take-up has been pretty small. The questioner uh, says about 0.5%. Um, I, I know in China, uh, they're still in the pilot phase, but they've been in a pilot phase for a couple of years, and I'm guessing that might be because the take-up is just not that big in, mm -hmm. a, in, in a given month. Uh, the amount of uh, use of their digital uh, CBDC, the ECNY, is less than what happens in a day uh, on Alipay. Yeah. So uh, the questioner wants to know, you know, if a digital dollar is built, how can you be confident it would be used? Or maybe to flip that on its head, uh, would that figure into your decision process about whether to have a digital dollar even if it met all of the other criteria? Yeah. Um, so I would say from the broader policy perspective of all the policymakers, including the administration, Congress, the Fed, demand for a digital dollar would be one of the one, a key factor. Um, the Fed has said they would not be interested in issuing a CBDC without support from the administration, from Congress, from the public at large. Um, a digital, you know, just to remind you, you know, a digital dollar is just a digital form of a current central bank liability. It's just a different form of money. Um, some of the main, some of the reasons countries do implement one is if they feel like they need to have a connection with the public as they stop to use, as they stop using cash 
regularly. In the US, it is not entirely clear that's needed, and that's why this space is still open and the discussions are ongoing. Um, it's, you know, so as we set up in the speech, we have both CBDC and instant payments. If your goal is payments efficiency, you have some alternatives. The digital dollar meets a slightly different need and could be issued if there is demand for it. I think that's very helpful and logical, as usual. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to try to get several questions into okay. one, and they have to do with national security issues globally. Uh, and you did mention uh, this topic in your remarks. Uh, so the questioners are interested in uh, U.S. strategy vis-a-vis -vis national security and payment system design. So for example, if a CBDC is, uh, is launched, does that help or hurt in terms of the ability of the U.S. Uh, to uh, achieve its national security objectives, for example, sanctions? Or what about the case of stable coins? Uh, does that make it more or less effective, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, ability to achieve its national security uh, aims? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned interacting uh, payment systems. There are other approaches. Right. So what, what are your thoughts in terms of this, uh, the byproduct of payment system design for national security objectives? Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to get ahead of where the working group is, but I can just lay out again the way we're thinking, the way the, some of the issues related to national security um, are being presented. So first, national security, of course, is an important policy objective absolutely important. The U.S. uses sanctions for a number of reasons to address national security threats and um, prevent bad actors from accessing the U.S. financial system. It does rely on the prominent position of the U.S. in the global financial system and the role of the dollar. Um, and so to the extent that CBDC can help support that, that is additive to um, you know, promoting our national security objectives. But I think it's, kind, it's important to distinguish between you know, whether you need a CBDC to promote those objectives, the global, value, the global role of the dollar, which as I mentioned in my speech, fundamental factors are probably first and foremost the main issue. It could be over time the technology, the way you get your dollar will matter, but I think free markets, free and deep markets, and institutions and rule of law are all just more stronger, more fundamental factors. Um, but I don't, the other way to think about this is whether getting a CBDC out there right away is important for maintaining the role of the dollar. One, in this area where technologies are just new and emerging and changing, I don't know what, whether the first mover advantage is as critical as in perhaps more, you know, you know, looking back, you can always find the first mover advantage, but when technologies are changing, it's not clear. Um, and there's other ways to get um, um, payments, as you say, instant payments, more efficient ways. We have multilateral platforms for instant payment systems. We talk about the number of countries um, establishing CBDCs and doing platforms. Uh, about 60 countries have RTGS systems and they're experimenting with those multi-platforms. So I think there are different ways. We absolutely have an interest in maintaining um, a system that we can use to address national security interests. But the exact you know, recommendation in terms of CBDC, I think, are still being, you know, debated and determined. Yeah, academics have uh, long uh, emphasized the value to the United States government of dollar dominance. It's a tremendous uh, uh, advantage Absolutely. that the United States has, and then not entirely aligned with uh, the disadvantages of, let's say, having a stable coin supporting dollar dominance, but at the same time making it difficult to uh, either um, 
enforce sanctions or avoid uh, illicit uses of money. So yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. Yeah. terrifically challenging yeah. topic. Yeah. I want to turn back to the uh, domestic front. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an excellent question on uh, how much of uh, payment services should be provided by the public sector, for example, with a CBDC versus the private sector. And this questioner is asking, uh, why should we rely on the government to do this when the private sector could do it? And I, I don't think it's necessarily a cynical question. It could mm -hmm. be, what, you know, genuinely, what are the advantages of having, uh, and this I is not, not, presume, not presuming that there's going to be a digital mm -hmm. dollar, but having mm -hmm. a digital dollar relative to having uh, the banks manage uh, payments uh, using the traditional method that dominates in the U.S. today. So the cent I, as I see it, so many non, not many private payment providers rely on payment rails that are connected to the central bank. CBDC would just be an alternative payment rail. So there are private sector payment systems that, but there's also usually a Fed offered system that is comparable. So I think there is a mix. Um, one could imagine in the future you could have tokenized bank deposits, you could have stable coins, you could have CBDC. I don't think that there's a predetermined outcome at this point. Um, CBDCs could just be wholesale. They could just be the settlement layer for private stable coins. Um, I think those are all options and certainly is something under consideration and not, there's not a presumption that if a CBDC were offered that there would be no other alternatives to a digital um, access. It's just, they wouldn't be central bank liabilities though. That's what's the key about the CBDC. It's just a central bank liability. Yeah, following up on that, mm -hmm. uh, one of the impetuses in that UK government Bank of England report for having a digital pound is that there might not be, if, if paper money continues to go out of mm -hmm. circulation mm -hmm. or is used less and less in payments, there might not be an official sector uh, payment instrument in the hands of the public. Yeah. Uh, and that's interesting because uh, a few years ago, the United Kingdom was more emphasizing that a digital pound could be um, enhance the strength of the payment system against invasion by cryptocurrencies or other undesirable payment approaches. Yeah. But now it's, it's, uh, the emphasis is coming back to, no, we really feel like uh, if there's no paper money, then the public deserves to have a public sector form of money. Mm -hmm. That might be the answer to the question that was just asked, but yeah. what is your view? Would it be uh, a concern uh, if paper money eventually, I know it's going down very yeah. slowly in the US, if it eventually went out of, out of circulation and then there was only private money left? Yeah, so I think that's part of the consultation process with the public. Um, as you say, cash is, usage is falling kind of moderately is not as much as in other countries. And I think it is an open question as to whether the public needs a, a central bank digital currency to feel a connection to the central bank. I would just point to an example of two countries, two European countries, Sweden and Norway, both of whom, both of the countries do not use cash anymore. One felt a strong need to issue a, or to issue a CBDC and push to an e-krona. One said, it doesn't matter. Our real-time payment system serves our public. We don't need a CBDC. And that was you know, last year. Things change, but so I think it really is about the public demand and what they, what they, what they need. I mean, there's costs and benefits of it. So. Um, in the US, I think that's just part of the consultation process that will need to be done. And hopefully going forward, we'll be more regular, a bit more public facing um, consultation. Uh, thank you, uh, Under Secretary Liang. Um, I think this might be a, a good point at which to uh, thank you on behalf of everyone here, the organizers of this meeting, and ask Josh Lipsky of the Atlantic Council to come back to the podium. 
uh, and tell us what we're going to be doing next. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Daryl, and thank you, Madam Undersecretary, for what was really a thoughtful and detailed and clear presentation of the administration's position on central bank digital mm -hmm. currency that I think will be widely read and dissected and poured over both here in the US, but as you pointed out in your speech around the world. Uh, because as we talk about and the work we do here, as we all know, what happens in the US matters to everyone around the world. And that's certainly true when it comes to the dollar. We have seen that played out in various forms, including in the national security realm over the past year. So I want to thank you for the time. And I want to thank you for underscoring by your presence here how this is a whole of government approach. We at the Atlantic Council will support in every way we can going forward. And we commit to helping. We can, what you said, the partners and allies component of that, which is so core to our mission. So we hope everyone continues to follow our work at the Atlantic Council on central bank digital currency and all issues of the future of money. Thank you all for being with us this morning. Have a great rest of the day.